Today, on the night of October 12, 1984, 20-year-old Angela Samoda eagerly picked up her telephone and dialed her boyfriend's number. But after he picked up and they spoke for just a few minutes, Angela's smile on her face faded quickly, and while she didn't exactly slam the phone receiver back onto its cradle, she did put it down with more force than she needed to. Angela actually really liked her boyfriend, and even now, after 10 months of dating, her heart beat faster whenever she thought of him. Handsome Ben McCall, already a few years out of college and already a construction project supervisor. But still, Angela couldn't help feeling really disappointed that he had just said no to her invitation to go out with her that night. Angela knew Ben had to be at work very early the next morning, but it wasn't exactly a common occurrence for her to ask him to do things like this. Because most Friday nights, and Saturday and Sunday nights, Angela was cooped up in her off-campus condo studying. Angela was a third-year student at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and she was enrolled as a double major in the school's highly competitive electrical engineering and computer science programs. Her goal was to use her degree to break into the heavily male-dominated world of engineering. And to ensure her dream became a reality, she had decided early on in her collegiate career to always put academics ahead of her social life. However, this did not mean Angela lacked a social life or that she was an antisocial person. Quite the opposite, in fact. Even though she lived off campus, Angela was the social chairperson of her college sorority. A sorority is a women's organization on a college campus whose purpose is to create a sense of community and friendship. And she was known among her big circle of friends not only for her intelligence and academic achievements, but also for her cheerful attitude and great sense of humor. Within her sorority, Angela was also known for always taking the time to regularly check in with her sorority sisters, chatting, asking how things were going, whether there was anything she could do to help people out. Angela was also strikingly beautiful. She was about five feet, four inches tall with a slender build. She had dark blonde, thick hair, blue eyes, a radiant smile, and she always looked fit and athletic. Angela was actually so attractive that not long ago, it had created a very uncomfortable situation for her. One of her admirers, a fellow college student, had begun just shamelessly following her around campus and leaving notes on her car windshield saying that he wanted to be part of her life. But in truth, that situation had actually worried Angela's sorority sisters much more than it worried Angela, because Angela just had a lot of faith in her own ability to take care of herself. Now, as Angela stood in her kitchen and wrapped her fingers on the counter next to the telephone, she suddenly decided she would just give her boyfriend one more call. Maybe she could change his mind about going out that night. After all, this was not just any Friday night. This was the day before one of the biggest sporting events in Texas. It was the annual rivalry game between the University of Texas and the University of Oklahoma. And it was being played right there in Dallas at the world-famous Cotton Bowl Stadium at the world-famous Texas State Fair. That night in Dallas, thousands of people, college students, alumni, residents, and tourists, would be out in force enjoying the State Fair, packing the local bars and nightclubs and restaurants, and gearing up for the next day's big game. But as Angela went to reach for the phone to call Ben back, she stopped herself and sighed she knew Ben was not about to change his mind. During their call, Angela had told him that her friend, Anita Kadala was going to be going out with them that night, meaning Ben knew he could turn down Angela's offer and Angela would not be left stranded for the night. She would have Anita to still go out with. Also on their call, Angela had even pulled out the big guns and tried to make Ben a little jealous to see if maybe that would convince him to go. She had told him that if he was going to stay in, then maybe she would just give Russell a call to see if he wanted to tag along with her and Anita for the night. Russell was really just a friend, but he was a male friend. However, Ben had not been phased and had just said, okay, sounds good, have fun. After sitting there for a moment, feeling totally annoyed and dejected, Angela suddenly sat up and thought, you know what, I will call Russell and see if he wants to go. So she went to her bedroom desk and rummaged around for the notebook where she kept her phone numbers. Once she found it, she turned to the B's page, and there it was, Russell Buchanan. Russell, who was 23 years old, had graduated a year earlier from Texas A&M's School of Architecture, 
but Angela hoped that he still liked going to college parties and sporting events. Angela had met Russell during his senior year at a happy hour one night with a group of mutual friends. Russell had immediately been attracted to Angela and had asked for her phone number. They exchanged information, and a few days later, Russell had called Angela and invited her out to lunch. Angela had said yes, but later wound up canceling on Russell, and so they never actually went out on a date. With her phone book in hand, Angela walked back to her kitchen, picked up the telephone, and dialed Russell's number. Even if he wound up not wanting to go, at least this way, Angela could apologize for canceling on him on that one date. But when Russell picked up, he was all in on the idea of going out with Angela and Anita, and so he agreed to meet the girls later that evening. Not long after speaking to Russell, Anita arrived at Angela's condo, and after doing a little bit of studying and taking a quick nap, the girls began getting ready for the night. Before she and Anita left the condo, Angela took one last look at herself in the mirror. She was wearing one of her favorite outfits. It was a black silk jumpsuit with an open back and a pair of black high heels. She knew she looked her very best, but once again, she found herself wishing that it was Ben she was going out with. Turning away from her reflection, Angela picked up her black purse, she grabbed her car keys, and then she and Anita left the second floor corner condo at 4944 Amesbury Drive. They headed down to the parking lot and hopped into Angela's Toyota Supra car. Angela was not a big drinker and had volunteered to drive them around that night. Angela turned on the car, she put it in drive, and then the two women drove the short distance to Russell's nearby apartment. After Russell climbed in the car around 9.30 p.m., the trio headed 10 miles south to their first stop of the evening, Bennigan's, a local bar known for its steak and ale. But Bennigan's was just a warm-up. By 11.30 p.m., Angela, Anita, and Russell had made their way first to the Boardwalk Beach Club, a singles bar that was popular for its 1950s and 60s style music, and then on to a nightclub in downtown Dallas called Nostromos. Shortly after they arrived there, Angela, who now missed her boyfriend even more than she had before she left, decided she would just give him another call and see if maybe now he would want to join them. But after being awakened from his sleep, Ben was not any more inclined to come out and meet Angela. However, since Ben was a member of the club where they were at, Nostromos, he called the front desk and got Angela and her friends access to their exclusive Rio room, which was the back room of the club. Angela still wished she could just have Ben, but the Rio room was a pretty good consolation prize. And so Angela spent the next hour or so dancing inside of this VIP area with Russell and Anita, and then when she wasn't dancing, she was walking from table to table saying hello to all the folks who were in there. According to Anita, it seemed like Angela knew literally everyone at the club that night. By 12.30 a.m., Angela was feeling tired, so she flagged down Anita and Russell and signaled that she wanted to leave. Angela had plans to get up early the next day and actually leave Dallas before the big crowds descended on the Cotton Bowl Stadium. She wasn't going to stick around for the big Texas versus Oklahoma game. Instead, she and some of her sorority sisters had decided to drive 100 miles south to Waco, Texas to watch the football game between their own school, Southern Methodist University, and Baylor University. When Angela, Anita, and Russell left Nostromos and stepped back out onto the street, the crowd outside, and really all around Dallas, was just as thick and rowdy as it had been earlier in the evening. The three friends made their way through the crowd to Angela's car that was parked in the outdoor lot across the street, and then about 15 minutes later, Angela pulled up in front of Russell's apartment. Before he went inside, he walked around and gave Angela a long hug, and then when Angela climbed back inside of the car with Anita, Anita looked at her and just rolled her eyes. Anita had had a great time that evening, but more than once when Russell was dancing with Angela in the Rio room, Anita had definitely felt like she was just a third wheel. Angela just laughed it off and said Russell was a friend, and then they pulled away from the curb and kept on driving. By 1.15 a.m., Angela had arrived outside of Anita's dorm room. Angela had asked Anita to stay with her at her condo, but Anita had politely declined. The women hugged and said they'd talk tomorrow. Then Anita went inside of her building, and Angela hopped back inside of her car and then pulled away from the curb and began driving back home. But, as Angela drove, she made a sudden decision to swing by Ben's apartment, which happened to be right on the way. Maybe, if she just appeared on his doorstep, he might invite her to stay. But, that did not happen. 
When Ben finally opened his front door, looking totally groggy and disheveled, he was not pleased to see Angela standing there. After a brief chat, he told her that as nice as it was to see her, he really just needed to sleep, so could she please just head home and they could talk tomorrow. Angela would eventually accept defeat and would turn around and head back down the steps towards the street below. After Ben watched his girlfriend climb back into her car and drive off, he turned around and went back inside and climbed back into his bed. But just 15 minutes later at about 1.45 a.m., right as Ben was finally dozing off again, he heard his phone ring. Groaning, he rolled over and picked up the receiver, already knowing that it had to be Angela, and it was. But this time, something was very different. She was not playfully trying to convince him to come see her. Instead, her voice sounded strained. Something was wrong. She was calling from inside of her condo, and her first words to Ben were both strange and distracted. Ben, Angela said, talk to me. And when Ben heard a sudden noise in the background and the sound of a voice calling out a question, Ben's anxiety flared. Angie, he said, are you okay? Angela hesitated for a second, and then, still speaking in that sort of distracted and disjointed voice, she said, I let a man into my condo. Before Ben could respond to this, he heard the sound of utensils clattering on the kitchen counter very close to the telephone, and Angela suddenly telling him in a rushed voice that she would call him back in just a few minutes before she suddenly hung up the receiver without even saying goodbye. By now, Ben was wide awake, and when a few minutes went by and Angela did not call him back, Ben dialed her number and got no answer. As he jumped out of bed and started pulling on his clothes, he called a second time, and again there was no answer. Now Ben felt a flash of panic, and still pulling on his jacket, he ran outside and he jumped into his truck. Although portable cell phones wouldn't be a thing until the 1990s, as a construction supervisor, Ben's truck was equipped with a satellite phone. And as he made the 8-10 to 10 minute drive to Angela's condo, Ben used that satellite phone to call Angela's number again and again, but still there was no answer. Once Ben pulled into the parking lot of Angela's condo building, Ben saw Angela's car in its usual space. He parked his truck not far from her vehicle, and then he leapt out of his truck and ran to the stairs to Angela's front door, where he began to press her doorbell while also banging on the door and calling out her name. When no one answered or came to the door, Ben turned and ran back down the stairs and around the building to another flight of stairs that led up to Angela's balcony and where her back door was. When he got up to that door, he began banging on it and calling out Angela's name again. But again, there was no answer. Ben would eventually leave the back door and run back to his truck out front, where he would use his satellite phone to call 911. At 2.17 a.m., the emergency dispatcher who received Ben's 911 call sent a couple of officers out to do a welfare check at 4944 Amesbury Drive. The dispatcher told the police officers that a young man named Ben McCall was worried something bad had happened to his girlfriend, Angela Samoda, who lived at that address. When the two police officers arrived at the scene 23 minutes later, they found Ben sitting quietly on the back steps leading up to Angela's condo. To that point, the two responding officers had spent that whole night and the early morning hours answering lots of complaints of noise and drunkenness and disturbance as all of Dallas seemed to be out on the streets partying. And so, tired and at the end of their shift, they were confident that this call would be no more serious than all the others they had been to so far. After directing Ben to go get the master key from the on-site building manager, the police officers walked around to the front of the property to knock on the door and to double check that the condo really was locked. It was locked, and after they knocked, no one answered, but a few minutes later, Ben arrived with the master key. With Ben waiting outside on the sidewalk, the police officers used the master key to open Angela's front door, and then they stepped inside. And almost immediately, the officers knew that this call was not like the others they'd responded to that night. On the carpeted floor of the living room just ahead of them, they could see there was a single black high-heeled shoe tipped over on its side, and near it was what looked like the track of another spike heel that had been dragged through the soft pile of the rug, like someone was still wearing that second high heel when they were dragged across the living room. 
After seeing this, both officers reflexively put their shooting hands down on their gun holsters. One of them, a rookie officer named Janice Crowther, who had just joined the Dallas police force one year earlier, immediately felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand up when she saw those two shoes. Turning around and looking out the front door, motioning Ben to stay where he was, Janice turned back and stepped into the living room for a closer look, while her partner turned left and headed for what looked like a bedroom door. A minute later, as Janice was looking around the living room and not really seeing anything, she heard her partner calling out, I think I found her. In the 31 years that Officer Crowther would go on to serve in the Dallas police force, she would never see a crime scene any more brutal than the one that met her eyes when she stepped into Angela's bedroom. Inside, Angela Samoda was lying on her back. While the upper part of her body was still on the mattress, her long, tanned legs dangled off the edge of the bed, not quite touching the floor. Her naked body was covered in blood, and it was clear right away that she had been the victim of an incredibly violent attack. The officers immediately rushed over to her and checked for a pulse, but Angela was deceased. After making sure the attacker was no longer in the condo, police radioed for an ambulance, crime technicians, and a team of homicide detectives. Within minutes, the street outside of Angela's condo, as well as her building's inside parking lot, became the scene of police cars and flashing lights as officers quickly cordoned off Angela's unit with yellow crime scene tape. 30 minutes later, lead detective Virgil Sparks and his partner, Russell Graves, were standing in Angela's bedroom looking at the ruined remains of a young woman who just hours before had had a vibrant life and a promising future. Their first impression was that this murder had been a crime of intense passion. In violent cases like this, where there was no sign of robbery, police knew from their experience that the motives were often rage, jealousy, love, revenge, or some combination of those. Detectives would need to wait for confirmation from the crime scene techs and the results of Angela's autopsy, but it certainly looked to them like Angela had been the victim of a violent sexual assault. And since there was no sign of forced entry, it also looked like Angela herself had opened the door to her attacker. From the defensive wounds on Angela's hands and arms, and the single high-heeled shoe that was still lying in the middle of the living room, detectives also surmised that there must have been a struggle and that Angela had likely tried to fight off her attacker. And from the smears of blood on the bedroom light switch and the bloody residue around the drain in the bathtub and on the bottom of the shower curtain, it also appeared that after killing Angela, her attacker had used her bathroom to try to clean themselves off before leaving the condo and taking the murder weapon with them. Feeling sure that the killer had to be someone who knew Angela, the first people that the police wanted to talk to were the men in Angela's life, starting with Ben. If it was true that Angela had called Ben at 1.45 a.m., when, according to Ben, she sounded distracted and in trouble, which had prompted him to go check on her at her condo, and given that Ben called 911 at 2.17 a.m., then the murder had to have occurred during those intervening 32 minutes. If the killer wasn't Ben, then that meant Ben had just magically arrived at the condo within minutes of the killer making their getaway. It just seemed too convenient for Ben. So the detectives believed Ben had to be involved, or at least know something about what happened. His proximity to the crime and connection to the victim was just impossible to ignore. 30 minutes later, Ben was sitting across from the detectives in the interrogation room at the Dallas police station. And the thing detectives noticed about Ben right away was his very unemotional response to what had just happened to his girlfriend. Ben just kind of sat there quietly as if nothing had happened. So when Ben again brought up the phone conversation he'd had with Angela at 1.45 a.m. when she sounded scared and she said that she let a man into her condo, the investigators were just not necessarily buying it. They felt like maybe Ben was making this call up. So the detectives focused their follow-up questions not so much on this call at 1.45 a.m., but on whether Ben had been jealous that Angela had gone out that night with Russell and not him, and whether maybe Ben was just angry because maybe he suspected that Angela had other men she was seeing romantically besides him. But Ben swore he had nothing to do with the murder, 
and even though he would refuse to take a lie detector test, he would agree to get blood and saliva samples, as well as scrapings from underneath his fingernails. He also agreed to let officers search his truck and condo and access his phone records. By later that same morning, police had three more names of possible suspects. Angela's sorority sisters had told them about a former boyfriend named Lance Johnson from Angela's hometown of Amarillo, Texas, who had once threatened Angela with a knife and who still called Angela wanting to get back together. The police also had the name of Joseph Patrick Barlow, the Southern Methodist University student who had been known to follow Angela around campus and leave notes on her car windshield along with writing love poems to her. And then there was Russell, the young architect who had spent the evening with Angela and Anita and who had asked Angela out on at least one date and had been stood up by her at least one time. But that afternoon on October 13th, as police were getting ready to follow up with each of these men, they received a critical piece of new information that would change everything. The preliminary results from Angela's autopsy had come back, and she had indeed been sexually assaulted and her attacker had left behind plenty of bodily fluids, including semen, which meant her attacker was a male. But a test of those bodily fluids showed something unique. It would turn out the man who attacked Angela was what's known as a non-secretor. A non-secretor is an individual, man or woman, whose blood type antigens do not show up in bodily fluid other than blood. In other words, their saliva or semen or other fluid secretions do not contain any markers of their blood type. Approximately 50 to 80% of all people are secretors, while 20 to 50% are non-secretors. And so this information immediately allowed police to start ruling suspects out. Today, police use DNA testing to track bodily fluids back to an exact individual. But back in 1984, when Angela was murdered, this kind of rough sorting of suspects using information like whether they were a secretor or not was about as good as police were going to get. So with the non-secretor news coupled with bulletproof alibis, the list of suspects suddenly dropped from four names down to just one. Not only was Angela's potentially violent and jealous former boyfriend Lance a secretor rather than a non-secretor, he was also asleep in his parents' house in Amarillo, Texas, on the night of Angela's murder. And although the student who had followed Angela around campus would turn out to fit the bill as a non-secretor, he too had a rock-solid alibi that ruled him out. That left two suspects, Angela's boyfriend Ben and Russell Buchanan. And while Ben had seemed very much like the number one suspect, the search of his truck and apartment had turned up nothing, and phone records placed him far enough from the scene at the suspected time of Angela's death that police doubted he had the time to commit the murder. He also was eventually proven to be a secretor. Russell, on the other hand, was a non-secretor, and he had been with Angela right before she was killed. And his apartment was only a five-minute walk from her condo. But what really snagged the police's interest in Russell was the fact that when investigators went to his apartment to interview him on October 13th, just hours after Angela's body had been discovered, Russell was nowhere to be found. In fact, it wasn't until Monday, October 15th, more than 48 hours after Angela's murder, that police finally found Russell at his home. And when Russell answered their knock on his door, he found a shotgun pointed directly at his chest. It wasn't exactly a raid, but it was clear to Russell that he was in some serious trouble. With the shotgun still aimed at his chest, detectives ordered Russell to go with them to the police station to answer questions about the murder of Angela Samoda. Once they were in the interrogation room, Russell told the detectives that he had nothing to do with Angela's murder. He said he didn't even know she had been killed until the police were at his door that morning with a shotgun pointed at him. He said the last time he saw Angela was when she and her friend Anita had dropped him off at 1 a.m. after the three of them had left the club. He told police that he was never involved romantically with Angela and that he knew she had a boyfriend and he was not jealous. When asked why he wasn't around on the 13th and 14th, Russell said he'd been at a wedding in Dallas before flying to Houston, Texas to visit his parents. 
and he had only just gotten back late on the 14th. Russell's story seemed plausible, but he didn't really have an alibi, and he was a non-secretor, so investigators could not rule him out as a suspect. However, without any other hard evidence that actually linked Russell to the crime scene or to Angela's death, Detective Sparks and Graves had to let Russell go. Over the next few weeks, six investigators, who were all assigned full-time to Angela's case, chased down every lead they possibly could. They interviewed everyone from friends and family to the mechanics who worked on Angela's car to the workers who had installed the carpeting in Angela's condo. But no one had any useful information. Crime Stoppers, a community program that encourages people to provide anonymous tips about crimes, featured Angela's case in a televised program and even offered a reward of $1,000 for any useful information. Also, Angela's own family offered a reward of $10,000 for information that would lead to her killer. But still, nothing came in. And as every lead seemed to go cold, Detective Virgil Sparks couldn't help but keep coming back to one name on his suspect list, Russell Buchanan. Russell had not been ruled out yet, and in Detective Sparks' eyes, Russell just seemed like the guy. And soon, one of Angela's friends, Sheila Gibbons, would become Detective Sparks' unlikely ally in his effort to uncover incriminating evidence against Russell. 22-year-old Sheila Gibbons was especially traumatized by Angela's death. Not only were the women both members of the same sorority, but also Sheila had been Angela's roommate during Angela's first year at Southern Methodist University. When they first met, it had seemed like the two girls did not have much in common. Sheila struggled with dyslexia, a learning disability that made it hard for her to correctly interpret words. And so while Sheila struggled with her studies and preferred socializing to books, Angela was the opposite. But over time, these differences actually seemed to draw the girls closer together. Sheila made sure that Angela didn't just study, and Angela helped Sheila focus on schoolwork. Even after Angela had moved into her own condo off campus, the women had remained very close, and just one week before Angela's murder, the two of them had had one of their regular get-togethers to catch up and chat about what was going on in their lives. On the weekend that Angela was killed, Sheila had been away from the university visiting her mother in North Texas, and that was where she was when she got a call from one of her sorority sisters who broke the terrible news. Sheila was completely devastated and as soon as she got back to the campus, she went straight to the Dallas police station to see if there was anything she could do or tell them that would help in their investigation into Angela's death. And it was there at the station that Sheila happened to look over and see some of the crime scene photos of Angela right after she had been raped and murdered. And it was a sight Sheila could just never forget. After speaking with Detective Sparks and getting the impression that he was especially suspicious of Russell, Sheila offered to arrange and record conversations between herself and Russell in hopes that Russell might tell her something incriminating. And on top of Sheila spying on Russell, police also set up 24-hour-a-day surveillance on Russell, and they also pulled him in for questioning on dozens of occasions, picking him up at his work or at his apartment or anywhere in between. But all of that came to a screeching halt in April of 1984 when Russell hired a well-known defense attorney who told police they had to either charge Russell with a crime or leave him alone. And because at that point police still had not unearthed any hard evidence against Russell, they were forced to just leave him alone. And so Russell became yet another dead end. And by the late spring of 1985, the Angela Samoda murder investigation had basically gone ice cold. And around the same time that investigators set Angela's files aside and changed the status of her case from active to suspended pending new information, Angela's friend and Detective Sparks' unofficial spy, Sheila, really started to struggle. Angela's unsolved killing had shattered Sheila's sense of safety and security, along with her belief in the justice system. Convinced that Russell had just gotten away with murder, and still feeling totally traumatized by the brutality of her friend's murder, Sheila would drop out of Southern Methodist University in the middle of her senior year. 
For a while, after she left school, Sheila just sort of drifted through her life, overwhelmed by the sense of numbness that Angela's murder had caused. Eventually, in 1986, Sheila would meet a man named Charles Wasaki, they would get married, they would buy a house together, and they would have kids together. And for the most part, Sheila was able to just kind of focus on her family and move on with her life and not let Angela's murder dominate every aspect of it. But all of that would change one evening in 2004. By then, Sheila was 43 years old and was living comfortably with her family in Nashville, Tennessee. And while she did still periodically think about her friend Angela, the thought of what happened to her was still so traumatic that often whenever Sheila thought of Angela, she tried to bury those feelings and not talk about them. But one night that year, as Sheila was sitting up in her bed alone, trying to complete some homework for a Bible study class, she happened to look up from her Bible, and what she saw at the foot of her bed shocked her. Standing there was her dead friend, Angela Samoda. According to Sheila, Angela looked exactly as Sheila remembered her. From the clear blue eyes to the huge smile that used to light up the room, her friend was dressed in the same brown sweater and matching brown skirt that she had been wearing the last time she and Sheila had gotten together at Southern Methodist University to catch up on each other's lives. Even though Angela would vanish just a moment later, Sheila described that experience of seeing Angela standing there as a, quote, God nod, a message not from Angela, but directly from God, that it was time for Sheila to get out there and make sure Angela's murder case finally got solved. As Sheila lay there in bed, stunned by what had just happened, she thought back over all the advances in DNA testing that had been made over the last 20 years and how every day it seemed like more criminals were being identified through the genetic traces they left behind, from their fingerprints to a stray hair or a drop of blood or saliva or semen. And so as she sat there, her sense of shock quickly gave way to a clear sense of purpose. She put her Bible down next to her and then she reached over to the table and she grabbed the phone off the nightstand. A moment later, she was talking to an officer at the Dallas Police Department, asking to speak with the detective in charge of investigating Angela Samoda's murder. And even though that call didn't net her any new information about the murder, that didn't stop Sheila from pursuing this God-given mission to solve her friend's murder. Over the next 12 months, Sheila would call the Dallas Police Station 781 times to request they do DNA testing in her friend's case to try to figure out who her killer was. But each time, the request was denied because the case was still cold, there were no new leads, and at this point, they didn't even think they had the original crime scene evidence anymore to test. And even if they did, DNA testing was very expensive, and for a case this old, it didn't seem worth it. Finally, after those 781 calls didn't work, Sheila decided to just get a private investigator's license. This way, she would have the professional credentials that would force the police to take her and her requests for DNA testing seriously. And in 2006, two years after Sheila had seen the vision of Angela in her bedroom, she finally started seeing real progress on Angela's case. That year, the Dallas police finally established a cold case department, and largely because of Sheila's rabid insistence over the years that they look into Angela's case, the first case this new department pulled for re-examination was Angela's. That year, working directly with Sheila, the detective handling Angela's case was able to track down the original physical evidence that had been collected at the crime scene, and they sent it off for DNA testing. Once the DNA analysis was finally completed, the results were entered into the Federal Bureau of Investigation's database of known and suspected criminals, but there was not an immediate match. However, investigators would continue to search that database, and finally, two years later in 2008, Sheila got a call from the Dallas police saying they had found a match, meaning they had finally discovered who killed Angela. And when they told Sheila who the killer was, she could not believe it. Based on the DNA analysis, along with other pieces of evidence and testimony, here is a reconstruction of what really happened to Angela Samoda. 
Back on the night of October 12, 1984, when Angela and her friends Anita and Russell were going from restaurant to restaurant and bar to bar having a good time, it didn't take long before Angela was drawing lots of admiring glances from men who were also at all of these establishments they were going to, especially when she and her friends stepped out onto the dance floor. Unlike a lot of the people who were out celebrating that night, Angela was drinking very little alcohol. As a result, her smile was genuine, her eyes were clear, and her movements were graceful and coordinated. The man who was sitting at one of the bars that night could hardly take his eyes off of this beautiful young woman in the black jumpsuit. And when Angela accidentally brushed up against him on her way to a table in the corner of that bar, this man felt a sudden thrill at the silky touch and warm scent of Angela's bare skin. It was then that he decided to follow her. He told himself that he just wanted to watch her, enjoy how good she looked, maybe just see where she lived and whether the boy she was with was also her boyfriend. So when Angela and Anita and Russell left the Nostromos Club at about 12.30 a.m., this man was waiting for them. He was standing just outside the exit to the club, maybe a few feet off to the side, so as not to be too conspicuous. Although this man was over six feet tall and weighed nearly 260 pounds, so he was enormous, and so trying to remain anonymous had always been a big challenge for him. But luckily, that night, the street was so crowded with drunk people that he hoped this beautiful girl and her two friends would not notice him. And when Angela and her friends emerged from the club, they didn't. They just walked right past him without a second look. The big man waited a few seconds to let them walk a little bit farther into the crowd, and then he put his hands in his pockets, he put his head down, and he began secretly walking behind the three friends. The trio would push past the big crowd out into the street, they would cross over to the other side, and they would make their way to the parking lot where they climbed into Angela's Toyota Supra. By the time Angela had turned her car on and began backing out of her parking spot, the big man who had followed them was now sitting only a few spots away in his idling vehicle. As Angela put her car into gear and began driving out of the parking lot, the big man put his car into drive and then eased his foot off the brake and slowly hit the gas. It wasn't long before the big man felt another thrill. At the first stop Angie made, that was the name he'd overheard her friends call her, the young man who had been with them got out. He hugged Angie and then made his way into the nearby condo building. Meaning, even if that young man was Angie's boyfriend, he wasn't going to be spending the night with her. A few minutes later, the big man could hardly contain his excitement when Angie stopped again, this time at a college dormitory where she said goodbye to her other friend, the girl. Angie was now all alone. But the big man's smile faded when Angie's third stop took her to an apartment where she knocked on the front door. This couldn't be her own place, or she would have just used a key and walked in. A minute later, an outside light switched on, and the big man saw another young man open the door, and a moment later, Angie had stepped inside and the door had shut behind them. So that was it, the big man thought, at least for tonight. That young man who had just opened the door must be Angie's real boyfriend, and she is going to spend the night with him. The big man suddenly realized how tightly he was gripping the steering wheel, and he took a few minutes to force himself to just breathe and relax. But even as he was getting ready to turn his car back on and drive home, the door to this apartment opened again, and he saw Angie step back outside, her blonde hair shining like a halo in the porch light. Watching intently from his car, the big man held his breath, then let out a sigh of relief when the young man inside the apartment stepped back inside and closed the door. Angie was alone again. Breathing a little faster now, the big man in the car watched as Angie walked back to her Toyota. She unlocked the door, slipped once more behind the steering wheel, turned on the engine, and pulled back out onto the road. She never noticed the car that pulled out behind her and followed her the rest of the way home. Ten minutes later, Angie was climbing the steps to her condo on Amesbury Drive. The big man had parked his car on the other side of the street and made a mental note of which unit was hers. He had made up his mind. He was going to go inside. But it was important that he got to her right now before she was settled in her bed. So, after taking a deep breath, the big man looked around him to make sure no one was watching. Then he climbed out of his car, he shut the door quietly, and began walking across the street toward Angela's building. 
Once she was inside of her condo, Angela put down her purse and hung up her car keys. But just as Angela was about to slip out of her black high heels and head for the bathroom, she heard a sudden but quiet knock on the door just a few feet away from where she was standing. Then she heard a man's voice and more knocking, still quiet but insistent. Whoever was out there sounded apologetic and kind of embarrassed, and so Angela stepped closer to the door and just listened. The man outside began talking again. He said he just needed to find out where the nearest payphone was. He'd just take a second or two of her time. Please, could you just open up the door? Reassured by the tone of his voice, Angela reached out and she unlocked the door. But then, before she could even turn the door handle, the man outside had pushed the door open himself and was now stepping into her condo. Forced backward, Angela felt a sudden rush of fear. The man in front of her was enormous, and he had these small, flat, green eyes and a thin mouth. And as soon as he was inside of her condo, he just started repeating his question about the payphone while also simultaneously turning around, shutting her door behind them, and locking both of them inside of her condo. Then, with the door locked, he turned back around and faced her and began slowly walking toward her while asking if he could use her bathroom. For just a second, Angela squeezed her eyes shut, trying to gather her thoughts and find a way to make him leave her condo. And then she thought of Ben. What she needed to do was call Ben. This huge man would never hurt her if he knew that she'd told her boyfriend that he was here in the condo with her. So, as Angela forced herself to open her eyes and face the big man who was bearing down on her, she also reached out for the phone on the kitchen counter and quickly punched in Ben's number. The man didn't try to stop her from using the phone. He just continued walking closer and closer to her while asking, where's your bathroom? Where's your bathroom? With the phone up to her ear, Angela quickly gestured to the intruder with her other hand toward a tiny hallway on the other side of the living room where the bathroom was located. As the big man suddenly turned away from her and began striding toward that hallway, Ben answered Angela's call. Right away, Angela began speaking, doing her best to stay calm, but her voice sounded strange and disjointed. Ben, she said, talk to me, please. And in the seconds that followed, Angela kind of awkwardly explained that she had just allowed a man into her apartment and he's using the bathroom and he's asking about a payphone and did Ben know if there was a payphone near her condo? Maybe if the intruder knew where the payphone was, he'd just leave. But before Angela could explain anything else, the big man emerged from that hallway near the bathroom and strode right back over to Angela and again began asking her over and over again, where's your bathroom, where's your bathroom? The big man was now so close to Angela that the only way to put distance between her and him was to hang up the phone and back up. And so Angela quickly told Ben she'd call him back in a few minutes, and then she dropped the receiver onto its cradle. But before Angela could step away, the big man had taken one of the knives out of her butcher block on the kitchen counter, and even as Angela tried to turn and run toward the front door to escape, the big man lunged and he grabbed her with one arm around the waist and began pulling her away from the door. Angela did her best to fight back, but her attacker was way bigger and stronger than she was, and so a moment later she was being forcibly dragged across her living room towards her bedroom. After throwing her onto her bed, the big man climbed on top of her and then pressed down hard with his left hand over her mouth and face to stifle her screams. Then he violently raped her. After he was done, with his hands still pressed down over her mouth, he straddled her torso with one knee on either side of her, making sure she couldn't move. Then, with his free right hand, he reached over and he grabbed the knife he had taken from the kitchen that was sitting on the bedside table. Then, while staring straight down at Angela's wide eyes, the man raised the knife in his right hand over his head, and then he brought it straight down with all of his strength into the center of Angela's chest. Angela tried to buck him off, but seconds later he had pulled the knife out of her and then drove it back down again into a new spot in her chest. And he would do this over and over and over again, 18 total times. The force of these blows were so great that they broke Angela's breastbone. And even though the knife may have been as short as two inches long, it would go straight through Angela's heart and then come out of her back. And every time this huge man who was crouched over her like a monster raised the knife again to strike, a spray of blood left a thickening trail on the headboard and wall behind Angela and coated her face and body with droplets. 
except where the killer's left hand covered her mouth and where his enormous body covered her bruised and naked skin. Janice Crowther, one of the police officers who first discovered Angela's body early in the morning of October 13, 1984, would later testify at the killer's trial that when she first walked into Angela's bedroom, it looked like Angela's heart had been cut out and was laying on top of her chest. It would turn out Angela's killer was a 36-year-old convicted serial rapist named Donald Bess, who had targeted Angela simply because he liked the way it felt when she accidentally bumped into him at the bar. That was all it took. Angela didn't know him, and he didn't know her. Angela was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Donald was already an experienced predator when he first came in contact with Angela. He'd gotten out of prison on parole just six months earlier, in March of 1984, after serving only six years of a 25-year-long sentence for rape, kidnapping, and aggravated assault. Although he was living and working in Houston, Donald had made the 240-mile drive north to Dallas several times that summer and fall to visit friends and to meet women at local bars. Nine months after getting away with the rape and murder of Angela Samoda, Donald would go on to rape, but not kill, yet another Texas woman. However, this time he was caught, and in 1985, he was sentenced to 999 years in prison, however, again with the possibility of parole. But in April of 2008, the DNA testing that Sheila had wanted the Dallas police force to do for so many years finally paid off, when the DNA at Angela's crime scene matched Donald Bess's DNA. On June 18th, 2010, Donald Bess was convicted of capital murder in the rape and stabbing death of Angela Samoda, and he would be sentenced to death. Now 74 years old, Donald is still on death row at Polunsky Prison in Livingston, Texas. While there is no execution date as of now, Donald will never be eligible for parole. As for Sheila, when she finally heard the name of Angela's real killer back in 2008, she was shocked. For more than 20 years, she had completely believed that Angela's killer was Russell Buchanan. In February of 2012, Sheila met with Russell in Dallas to apologize for her attempt back in 1984 to connect him to Angela's murder, and her belief in the years that followed that he was the guilty party. Now a well-known and successful architect in Dallas, Russell was quick to forgive. In the end, Sheila's persistence had not only led to the discovery of Angela's real killer, but it had also finally lifted the cloud of suspicion Russell had been living under for more than two decades. Sheila is still a practicing private investigator. Her specialty is cracking cold cases. In 1970, 14-year-old Keith Sapsford was living in Sydney, Australia with his parents, and he was desperate to travel the world. His parents wanted him to be able to travel, they just lacked the resources to be able to afford that kind of thing. However, they were able to pull a little bit of cash, and the three of them did go on a nice European vacation that his parents were hoping would kind of calm down his desires to want to travel all the time. They thought this would be, you know, a taste before he got older and he could go travel as much as he wanted. But when he came back from that vacation, it really had the opposite effect. It was like Keith had experienced the life that he so desperately wanted and now he's home and it's like that life has been taken from him. Following that vacation, Keith began trying to run away from home. Not because he didn't want to be around his parents, but just because he saw it as his only way to, you know, see the world. But every time he would run away, his parents would quickly find him and bring him back home. Their concern for their son would only grow, though, because he would find ways to sneak away and be gone for longer and longer stretches of time. And they're thinking it's only a matter of time before he really gets hurt. In an effort to save their son, they ended up enrolling him in this very strict boarding school that was for boys with behavioral problems. And they were hoping that the staff at the school was gonna be able to kind of calm their son down and keep him from trying to run away all the time. But unfortunately, the school really had the opposite effect because the school, in a sense, was like a prison. You weren't allowed to leave. And so immediately, Keith, when he gets there, he's looking for ways to escape this boarding school. And two weeks after arriving, he would be successful. He would elude the staff and he would escape. 
Three days after he had escaped this boarding school, he found his way to the Sydney airport. Now, this is the 1970s, and it was far easier to get into an airport than it would be today, where there's lots of security. There wasn't much of that at the time that Keith was at the airport. And so Keith walked across the tarmac to a plane that was bound for Tokyo, and he climbed inside the wheel well. He tucked himself in there, and he waited for takeoff. A photographer named John Gilpin happened to be at the Sydney airport on the same day that Keith is now snuck into that wheel well, and he had a new lens for his camera that he was testing out. And at one point, he was just taking pictures of the tarmac, and he began taking pictures of a plane that was taking off. And it was the same plane that Keith had snuck into. And he takes pictures of it as it takes off, it goes up to altitude and it flies away. And he just took a series of pictures of it, puts his camera away, doesn't think twice about it. A week later, John was looking through his photos and he stopped when he saw this picture. John had inadvertently captured the final moments of Keith as he fell nearly 200 feet to his death. As soon as the pilot took off, the wheels were retracted opening up that wheel well for a brief second and there was nothing for Keith to hold on to and he slipped out. But even if he had not fallen out, he almost certainly would have died from freezing temperatures and lack of oxygen at altitude. On April 1st, 1990, a police officer in Arizona was driving on the highway when he saw a tractor trailer that was pulled over on the side of the road with its hazards on. And so he pulls over, he gets out, walks out to the driver's side door, and he looks up at the driver and says, hey, do you need any help? And the driver is still sitting in the driver's seat, hands on the wheel, he's barely acknowledging the police officer. And he kind of looks down and shrugs and just says, no, I'm okay. The police officer doesn't know what it was, but there was something off about this guy. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but there was something off about him. He couldn't tell what it was. So he asked him again, are you sure that nothing is wrong? And the driver, again, very sketchy, just says, no, nothing's wrong. And so the police officer acting on a gut instinct says, hey, can you step out? Do you mind if I talk to you outside of your vehicle? And so very reluctantly, the driver kind of slithers his way out of the vehicle, making sure that he doesn't fully open the door to kind of let the officer see what's going on inside his cab. He gets out and shuts the door and the two start talking. Over the course of their conversation, where basically the officer is trying to figure out what you're doing here. Why are you parked on the side of the road with your hazards on? Why aren't you telling me what's going on? Why are you acting so strange? At some point, the officer just kind of had enough and he said, hey, you know what? I'm gonna need to search your vehicle. He opens up the door and goes inside and there's nothing out of the ordinary in the front two seats. But when he looks into the back section where there was a sleeping compartment, because this is a big 18 wheeler and there's like a little area in the back of the cab where these guys doing these long drives can sleep. When he looks into that section, he sees there's this woman with her mouth gagged, handcuffed, huddling in the corner of this sleeping section, looking absolutely terrified. The officer immediately gets out and he grabs the guy and he puts him under arrest. As he's arresting him, the driver is saying, no, she wants to be here. She chose to be here. But the officer didn't buy it. And he said, you're under arrest for kidnapping. The officer puts this guy in his cruiser and shuts the door. And then he calls for backup. When backup arrived, they were able to take the woman out. She was unhurt. She survived. But it would turn out that she was one of the very, very lucky few because the driver was Robert Rhodes, AKA the truck stop killer, who over the previous 20 years had killed over 50 women. He was one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. But the crime that the truck stop killer was actually known for was not this kidnapping where this woman survived. It was the kidnapping and murder of a woman named Regina K. Walters. Regina was a young woman who came from a broken home, and at the age of 14, she ran away and began hitchhiking across Texas with her boyfriend. In February of 1990, Rhodes picked up Regina and her boyfriend who were looking for a ride. Rhodes almost immediately kills Regina's boyfriend and takes Regina captive, and he keeps her chained up in his traveling torture chamber for several years before ultimately killing her as well. After Rhodes was finally arrested by this Arizona police officer on the side of the highway, the investigation searched Rhodes' house and they found some pictures. This is a picture of Regina K. Walters in the abandoned barn where her body was ultimately found immediately after Rhodes took this picture. <laughs>
On September 6, 1992, two moose hunters that were hunting just outside of Denali National Park in Alaska were walking up to a well-known landmark amongst hunters in the area. It was this old school bus that was parked in the middle of nowhere. It was all rusted over and nature had practically overgrown it. And hunters, trappers, and travelers would use this bus as kind of like a center point that you would reference where you were going relative to this particular bus. But when they walked up to it, they saw on the outside of the door that there was a note. Attention possible visitors, SOS, I need your help. I am injured, near death, and too weak to hike out of here. I am all alone, this is not a joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you, Chris McCandless, dated August question mark. Five months earlier, in April of 1992, Chris McCandless, the one who wrote that note, had hitchhiked from Carthage, South Dakota to Fairbanks, Alaska. Once there, he hitchhiked again with an electrician named Jim Gallian, who was making his way out of Fairbanks. Chris introduced himself as Alex and asked Jim if he would take him to Denali National Park, which was about two hours away to the southwest. On the drive, Jim asked Chris what he was gonna be doing at the park, because this is like wild Alaska country and frankly, Chris did not look like a rugged Alaskan outdoorsman. Chris told Jim that he was gonna be living off the land for a few months. Jim would later say that he had serious doubts about Chris's ability to survive in the Alaskan bush. As it was, Chris only had a light backpack, did have a rifle, but he really didn't have warm clothes on. He only had 10 pounds of rice. That was the only thing he brought for food. He didn't have a compass. He didn't have a map. He didn't have a watch. He just seemed totally ill-equipped for what he was saying he was going to go do. At some point, Jim tried to convince Chris not to go or to at least postpone. And he even offered, hey, I'll drive you up to Anchorage and I'll buy you equipment. You need the right equipment for what you're gonna be doing. Let's go there first. But Chris was stubborn and so Jim ultimately relented and said okay he drove him to the park before chris left jim actually gave him a pair of warm boots that he had in his truck he said here you can use these more than i can and chris thanked him took his boots and he was on his way although chris was planning for this extensive hike through denali national park all the way to the bering sea but chris would only make it about 20 miles into his journey before stopping at an old rusted bus just outside of the park Chris would live in this bus for 16 weeks, and according to his diary, that first week he was there was particularly rough. He was snowed in, he couldn't catch anything to eat, so he's hungry and cold, but shortly thereafter, he developed a routine. He was able to hunt successfully for some small game. He found some plants that were good to eat, and by and large, his entries made it seem like he was very happy. However, the last month of diary entries really painted a very different picture. After living in this bus for nearly three months, he indicated in his diary that he was kind of sick and tired of living off the land and he was ready to return back to society. So on July 3rd, he packs up his camp and he starts walking back the 20 miles towards where he came into the park in the first place. But when he came into the park three months earlier, the river that he was gonna need to cross was frozen. And now that he's returning in the summer, it had thawed and now it's the 75 foot wide raging river that was basically impossible to cross. And so he's trapped on the wrong side of this river. What he didn't know because he didn't have a compass, he didn't have a map, he didn't know the area well, was there was actually a hand operated tram that would take you across the river in the summer that was only a mile away from his camp that was labeled on almost every map. In addition, there was a hunting cabin not far from that tram that's also on just about every map of this particular area that had food, it had clothes, it had bedding. He could have stayed in this hunting cabin until conditions were okay again to make the journey back home. But again, he doesn't have a map, so he doesn't know these things exist. So at some point he turns around and goes back to the bus feeling totally dejected. That night, his journal entry just said, rained in, river looks impossible, lonely, scared. All of Chris's diary entries following his return to the bus after not being able to cross this river got shorter and bleaker and really painted a picture of a guy that was going downhill. The final entry in Chris's diary just says beautiful blue berries. And then 19 days after his final entry is when those two moose hunters find this bus and see the note, the SOS note pinned to the outside. The hunters go inside the bus and there laying in a sleeping bag is the body of Christopher McCandless. 
Although it's not entirely clear how Christopher actually died, the two most common theories are either starvation or perhaps he ingested a poisonous plant seed. The hunters alerted authorities who came out and they launched an investigation and during this investigation they found Chris's camera. Chris was an avid photographer, he had taken loads of pictures over the course of his stay out in the wild. This is the final picture that he took on his camera. It's evident from Chris's SOS note on his door that he did want to escape, he wanted to leave the wild. But what's also clear is that at the end, he realized he wasn't going to. The note he's holding in his hand says, I have had a happy life and thank the Lord, goodbye, and may God bless all. And so he took one last dignified picture of himself before curling up in a sleeping bag and passing away.